So I shall tell you what CDEF is. <laughs> so chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension is, um, is classified as group four disease. You've heard a lot about uh, groups one through three. And, and the, the unique thing about this group, of course, is that it is D1 type of pH that can be cured via surgical procedure called pulmonary thromboendarterectomy. And basically what it is, is its pH arising from single or regular pulmonary emboli. So we do think that the disease starts with an acute pulmonary embolism, one or more episodes of that. And then what you get is incomplete resolution and, and then progressive scarring of pulmonary vasculature segments. And then concomitant to that, there is a development of a small vessel disease, even in areas without thrombotic occlusion that contributes to the development of pulmonary hypertension. And so for, for the diagnosis of CTEF, you, know, you need two things. You need uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension, as defined like you've heard today, and you need per persistent perfusion defects despite being on anticoagulation, and traditionally is at least three months of anticoagulation. The presence of perfusion defects can be ascertained via any of the uh, chest imaging modalities. And the, uh, and the asterisk tells you here that there are some patients who have chronic thromboembolic disease without pulmonary hypertension. So there is such a thing, and some of those are symptomatic, some of those are not. But the vast majority of people will have to fit these two criteria. <clears throat> And just to give you an idea of the scope of the problem, so the, the way to view CTEF, of course, is that CTEF is really a rare complication of a common condition, right? So pulmonary embolism is very common. Uh, estimates uh, range from 300 to 600,000 cases annually in the US. Some, some estimates actually are up to 1 million. And then uh, about 60 to 100,000 of those uh, lead to death. So you're probably left with a, a lot of uh, survivors of uh, PE, and a conservative estimate of the rate of development CTEF after acute uh, PE is around 1%. If you, if you take that, uh, then you end up with uh, 2,400 up to 5,000 cases of CTEF every year in the US alone. And I can tell you, we don't know exactly how many operations are done in this country, but certainly it's, no, it's much less than, than 1,000. So it's, uh, just to bring the point that it is an under-recognized disease, and while it is a rare complication of PE, PE is so common that the scope of the problem is rather dramatic. And then so the, the title of the talk is what it's different about it. So I'll try to highlight a few things that uh, tell apart uh, CTEF from non-thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. The first one is epidemiologically, these patients tend to be uh, older. And that, again, just reflects the fact that older people get blood clots. But it, it's being seen in children, and certainly you can see it in, in the elderly population. And then there are some risk factors for CTEF when, when compared to non-thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. This is data from Europe and uh, odds ratios. And of course, these are highly inflated because of the numbers are low. But certainly it's been known for years that uh, the presence of VA shunt, uh, which we don't see anymore, are a risk factor for CTEF. What we're seeing more recently is infected pacemakers. Uh, cardiologists uh, frequently uh, uh, insert these pacemakers. And we have operated on cases where these leads get infected, and that leads to thromboembolism. Splenectomy, uh, certainly previous uh, uh, thromboembolic events, particularly if they're recurrent. Uh, uh, blood groups other than O are a risk factor for CTEF. This has been consistently shown in many studies. Lupus anticoagulant and antiphospholipid antibodies, as well as in this particular study, for the first time, uh, thyroid replacement therapy was shown to be a risk factor. This hasn't been confirmed, and I'm not so sure that that is entirely true. But certainly a history of malignancy makes sense. Uh, we, we do see that that's a risk factor for, for CTEF. Traditionally, the, the numbers that were quoted was 25 up to 50 percent of patients with CTEF did not uh, present with a history of PE, and, and, and the, this large European registry showed that about 75 percent of patients with CTEF will tell you that they had a, a, a previous PE. So, but it is a sizable minority, about a quarter of the, uh, of the patients, that will not uh, tell you a history of, of PE, and then, you know, that this should not come as a surprise because PE, again, is also under-recognized, sometimes difficult to diagnose. We know that that, that is a, a true statement. So the absence of a history of DVT or PE does not make CTEF unlikely in, in somebody with pulmonary hypertension. And so, again, we think that acute PE uh, precedes the onset of, of uh, this, uh, this condition. But we also know that the vast majority of, of acute PEs go away, right? So the, there's a 96 to 99% rate of uh, resolution. But then we will uh, explain a little bit more about what we mean by that. So if you look at imaging studies of uh, patients after an acute PE, and this is a, a group of studies that these authors pulled, including VQ and CT scan, and then you follow them up over time, you will see that roughly, for example, around three months, 
uh, almost 70% of patients still have perfusion defects. And if you follow them up almost up to a year, 11 months or so, um, about half of them still have perfusion defects. And so uh, the, the persistence of perfusion defects does not equal symptomatic CTEF. Uh, not all of these patients had CTEF. They didn't have the data to, to show or, or disprove that. But the key point here is that sometimes it just takes some time for these perfusion defects to go away. And, this, and we certainly see a lot of people walking around with no symptoms, normal pulmonary pressures, with persistent perfusion defects. Some people use this data to advocate for getting a new baseline after an acute PE, getting perhaps another CAT scan at six months or so, but that's certainly you know, debatable. It's certainly not standard of care, and it's not my practice, actually. So the point is, sometimes uh, it takes time for PEs to go away in imaging studies, so don't, don't, it's not really useful to get frequent CT scans after an acute PE if the patient is doing well. Now, well, how likely it is, though, to, to go on and develop CT, this is the famous Pengo study that followed patients after an acute PE first episode and followed them up with symptoms and eventually workup for CTEF when patients were symptomatic. So this is rates of symptomatic CTEF, and what they found was that up to two years, uh, the rate was 3.8%, and past two years, they didn't really see any cases. So it seems like the, the, the risk is higher uh, within the first two years, but certainly we, we see in patients that present years after the Sentinel event, uh, and, and they still you know, present to us with uh, symptomatic CTEF. So this is, the, this is the, the perhaps most widely quoted rate. Subsequent studies have shown rates as low as 0.5 to 1%, and then there are studies showing rates of uh, even 30%, particularly in those patients with recurrent PEs. Uh, so there, there is a, a sort of wide variation in the estimates there. So again, so then we will qualify that the most acute PEs go away. Uh, it's resolution without hemodynamic compromise, again, because sometimes perfusion defects are persistent. So who among these patients go and develop CTEF? So we talk a little bit about risk factors, but certainly other risk factors include the presence of a large PE. If the PE, if the PE was unprovoked, uh, and if you had more than one PE, certainly that increases your chance of developing CTEF. Again, permanent IV catheters, pacemakers, things like that, that particularly if they get infected. Splenectomy, non-all non blood group. Cancer, lupus anticoagulant, antiphospholipid antibodies, and factor eight, elevated factor A levels. Those are sort of the risk factors that we typically see. And then, as I alluded to early, these patients also develop unrelated small vessel, meaning small vessel disease not in areas occluded by clot, and that contributes to the development of symptomatic uh, pulmonary hypertension. And so the pathophysiology, uh, or I should say the pathogenesis, uh, again, we, and this is actually, a, sounds like a trivial point, but we really think that this starts with an acute PE uh, that then undergoes incomplete resolution and organization. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of interest in lack of thromboangiogenesis uh, uh, as part of this uh, problem. And then uh, basically what happens is that these clots become scarred up and again, they atta attach completely to the pulmonary vessel walls and then they get uh, uh, you know, uh, poor perfusion and then adaptive uh, vascular remodeling of, uh, of resistant vessels. And this process is uh, colored by inside to thrombosis, but particularly things like infection, inflammation, immunity, and some uh, uh, people are beginning to look into some genetic predisposition, uh, like particularly polymorphisms in the fibrinogen gene. Dr. Farber show you this better than I could. Moving on to uh, physical examination, uh, again, the, the, the clinical presentation is exactly as any other patient with pulmonary hypertension, this neon exertion, and the physical examination may offer you a clue. So this, this was reported by Bill Auger uh, uh, many years ago. Uh, in, in a minority of patients, perhaps 25 to 30 percent of them, if you listen carefully to their, the four quadrants of their chest, you will hear brutes, and, and this is felt to be due to turbulent blood flow, and, and you know, since I started doing this, I can tell you that, yes, it's probably true that you see this in about a quarter of, of the patients when you look for that. And when you find them, you know, it's highly, highly suggestive of CTEF. The, the absence of this, of course, does not uh, rule out the, the disease. Now, a little bit about natural history. So what happens with this disease when it goes untreated? Well, it's pretty deadly, and not surprisingly, it has to do with pulmonary hypertension. So you can see here that if the mean PA is higher than 40, five-year survival is only 30 percent, and if it's more than 50, it's 10 percent. So this is a pretty, uh, pretty deadly disease, and then I'll, I'll submit to you that uh, if, if you uh, uh, successfully operate these patients, then you'll have a five-year survival of about 90 percent. So that's, 
That's huge, right? So it's, it's a huge difference. And then the other thing here is that remember that survival of lung transplantation, which is oftentimes uh, something that happens to these patients, they get referred for lung transplantation, five-year survival is 50%. So if, if you can give them, a, give them a different operation, it's a, it's a huge difference that you make into, into this patient's uh, life. So uh, because of this, you have to have a heightened index of suspicion, and, and this is pretty much how, how we, we do the diagnostic evaluation. We assess for pulmonary hypertension, and then we have to detect and then quantify the degree of vascular occlusion. The first one, you've heard about this, you know an echo, echo is a reasonable screening test, but then you do need the right heart cath to uh, find pH and assess its uh, severity. And then to detect uh, uh, vascular occlusion, the VQ scan is the preferred test. Uh, but then to quantify the degree of vascular uh, occlusion, you need pulmonary angiography, and that is typically via CT and conventional pulmonary angiography. Some centers are using MR as well. Uh, we have a little bit, but not, not a whole lot. But bottom line is you need pulmonary angiography for a detailed anatomic uh, uh, assessment of the clot. So this is a little bit of data behind that. So uh, uh, this is a retrospective, uh, retrospective study out of the, the, the UK, more than 200 patients. Uh, uh, they, they had uh, 78 uh, had CTEF, and uh, these uh, investigators went back and looked and found that the sensitivity of VQ scan was in the high 90s percent, and the CT scan was only uh, about 50 percent. And so, and then this question gets asked frequently, and, and the truth is that uh, there, are, there are a couple of things to add to this. Uh, a more recent study actually showed that uh, uh, CT is just as good as, as, as VQ scan, and, and the reality is that it's probably true. But the main, li the main difference lies in the fact that uh, to interpret a VQ scan, all you need to see is whether or not there is a perfusion defect. And, and uh, all, all nuclear uh, chest radiologists are trained to do that because they, they are trained to look for PEs. So all you're looking for is a perfusion defect. However, it takes considerable experience and expertise to find chronic clots on a CT scan. And, and, and chest radiologists are not routinely training that. So, so if, if you have expert, an expert set of eyes looking at a CAT scan, you are very likely to find uh, chronic thromboembolic disease just as frequently as a VQ scan. But as a general population-wide, if you wish, screen tool for uh, CTEF, the VQ scan is much easier to interpret because all that you're looking for is a perfusion effect. And this is why we and, and most experts, all experts, I should say, advocate for uh, the VQ scan as the best screening test for, for this disease. And so this is what you're looking for. Uh, so ventilation here, perfusion here, and you can see perfusion defects here, there. Uh, this is an anterior view. This is a posterior view. Perfusion defect, perfusion defect, perfusion defect. Uh, and then, so the importance of this is that if you don't assess patients with pulmonary hypertension with a VQ scan, you're likely to be missing a lot of patients with CTEF. And again, if you miss that, you're missing a huge opportunity to offer a potential curative intervention. This is data from the query registry, where in academic or community centers, uh, patients with a diagnosis of pH uh, had a VQ scan in about 50 to 65% of the time. So there's a huge chunk of patients with pH that never got screened for, for CTEF. So there is a huge missed opportunity here. We are using also VQ with SPECT, so CT with uh, uh, SPECT, and then we fuse these, and then we can get pretty um, uh, color pictures, and they actually just make the interpretation much easier than planar images, because you can see easily a perfusion effect here compared to, to that, so that helps a little bit. Uh, but then, again, CT scan is a very important test. Again, it, it helps you quantify the degree of vascular obstruction, and this cartoon tells you what we see on CT scanning, so after an, a fresh a fresh thrombus, the ideal situation is that it goes away, but sometimes it undergoes uh, stenosis, webs or bands, uh, recanalization, retraction with partial uh, obstruction, and sometimes retraction with total uh, uh, occlusion of the vessel. And I'll just show you some examples. This is acute PE. The, 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 way, the way you know it's acute is because the vessel is plump, so a, it's completely occluded, but the vessel is big, it's, it's, it's plump. And then same patient, uh, this goes away. So there is a retraction and occlusion of those vessels. And this is what we typically see that gets missed outside. If you are not trained to look for this, you are uh, frequently going to call no PE here. And yes, there is no acute PE, but this is retraction and total occlusion after an acute PE. Uh, again, another clue of acute PE, so a clot attached to the vessel wall forming acute angles with a vessel wall. That's acute. Uh, and if the clot forms uh, obtuse angles, that's uh, chronic. 
uh, again, layering cloth uh, in these uh, uh, reconstructions. And then uh, sometimes uh, you can see a web, actually, that in this case was also seen on uh, pulmonary angiography, which takes me to pulmonary angiography. Uh, in our view and in the US, certainly, uh, in conventional pulmonary angiography remains the gold standard test, and we advocate for it for everybody to get a final assessment. This slide is to uh, emphasize the notion that you need at least two views. Uh, oftentimes, we do even three views. So this is one oblique view where you can you know, gain uh, some appreciation that there is perhaps a perfusion defect, but only when you use the opposite oblique view, then you can see an abru abrupt uh, cutoff of a basilar artery going down to the left uh, lower lobe. Uh, these are examples of uh, patients that we've seen recently uh, over the last few years, complete uh, retraction and stenosis here, tapering and occlusion of the right upper lobe uh, branch, complete uh, cutoff of a right middle lobe branch, and this is complete occlusion of a right upper lobe with what with a so-called straight uh, straight edge appearance. And this is a so-called pouch defect. And it's hard to appreciate, but it's a, like a lumpy appearance at the takeoff of the right interlobar artery with a subsequent filling defect. This is a band with post-stenotic dilation. And and so uh, the, we think that all these tests are complementary. And the next slides are uh, to highlight some some key points. Oftentimes, uh, 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 we, we get people that get a, a VQ, is read as low prop, and then we say, well, so if it's low prop, then, then the patient does not have CTEF. And, and this is a low prop VQ scan because you have a perfusion defect, but uh, it's actually certainly matched by ventilation and by pipette criteria developed for acute PE, that's low prop. And, and if we do a VQ uh, with SPECT, uh, again, we see that it's pretty well matched. But if you do a VQ scan on the same patient, he has prominent chronic thromboembolic occlusion. So we see this not uncommonly, particularly in those who have uh, uh, occlusion for a long time. You start to see volume loss, resorption of atelectasis. Sometimes they have uh, uh, recovering infarcts that they lead to ventilation defects. So a low probe uh, VQ does not exclude CTEF. What, what excludes CTEF is a normal VQ, meaning no perfusion defects. <clears throat> And then this is a patient that we saw uh, uh, this year too, uh, referred by a negative, uh, with a negative CT chest with a shortness of breath. And then you get a VQ scan and he has uh, perfusion defects. This is an anterior view of perfusion scan, uh, right upper lobe perfusion defect, right lower lobe there too. And in a posterior view, you can see perfusion defects. And when we look at the CT scan, we actually could not appreciate any clots, but we're doing these uh, dual energy uh, CT scans with uh, iodine perfusion mapping. And we see the same thing. There's a perfusion defect in the right upper lobe, in the right lower lobe, and actually one in the lingula that we didn't appreciate on the VQ scan. Again, and no clot on the, on the CT chest. But you do a, a pulmonary angiogram, and you see an abrupt cutoff of a, a segmental branch in the right upper lobe. And you can appreciate some tapering here of segmental areas, and, uh, which is easier, much easier appreciated uh, here. So again, all these imaging modalities are complementary to each other, and we feel that so you, you need a dedicated team and expertise to sort of tease, tease these patients out. So that brings me to the treatment algorithm. So every patient needs to be referred uh, uh, for uh, surgical evaluation. Uh, so once you make the diagnosis, uh, you, you need to continue a lifelong anticoagulation, uh, and but you need an operability assessment by, C, by a CTEF team. Again, because this can be cured with this operation. So every patient deserves an operability assessment. Uh, and so, of course, you, you will move on to that. Now, if this is deemed to be non-operable disease, then certainly uh, you can move on to targeted medical therapies. Uh, and if that doesn't work, uh, uh, lung transplantation. And there's a new kid on the block. There's some, some you know, emerging experience with uh, bronchial pulmonary angioplasty, not bronchial, uh, balloon pulmonary angioplasty. Uh, and you know, there's some talk, talks about moving this perhaps up here. Uh, so that's coming, but the, the, but the bottom line is that you need an operability assessment in every patient. And the reason this needs to be done in an expert center is because this largely remains an art. There is no set guidelines or objective parameters that tell you that one patient is operable uh, or non-operable. And so the, the way we kind of handle the decision is uh, to answer a, a few questions. The first one is, is there chronic thromboembolic disease uh, that matches the degree of pulmonary hypertension? Uh, second question is, uh, how much microvascular disease, meaning microvascular disease that cannot be operated, we have? And then, of course, you need to consider surgical expertise and the comorbidities of the patient. So these, the, first, the answer to the first question uh, uh, is predicated upon uh, pulmonary angiography and essentially what's the pulmonary vascular resistance. 
in, in the answer to this question, uh, uh, we, we tried to figure out whether or not there is a hemodynamic to radiographic uh, matching. In other words, the amount of pulmonary hypertension that I see, do I think is accounted for the degree of thrombotic occlusion that this particular patient has? That's, that's the key question. And, and, and I'll show you a couple of examples. So this guy uh, has a PVR of almost 700, and it's hard to appreciate, but I mean, basically this pulmonary angiogram looks pretty decent. Uh, if you look carefully, there's some perfusion defects and some subsegmental uh, 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 tapering of, of these vessels. And so a patient like this, uh, uh, first of all, it's unlikely that this is surgically accessible, but even if it is, uh, with a PVR of 680 and with this little uh, amount of thrombotic burden, it's very unlikely that you're gonna make him better with uh, an operation. And, and so this patient actually ended up being enrolled into the pivotal medical therapy trial and was deemed to be a, a non-surgical candidate. Compare that to this, a similar, if perhaps a little bit less uh, PVR, but then now you have a complete occlusion of this branch here, pretty much complete occlusion of, of the left lower lobe. So this is a patient that you think, well, you know, there's a lot of clot, there's a lot of pulmonary hypertension, but they kind of seem to match. But, you know, there's a little bit of an art to this, and uh, there is no set guideline. Uh, and so this requires a team, uh, experience, and, and expertise. And the reason, because, uh, the reason behind this is that the reduction of the PVR is key. So if you operate somebody and you bring down their PVR, they do well. If you operate and, they, and you don't bring down the PVR, they die. So, so that, that is the, 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 the key distinction. And this is data from San Diego where if the PVR is more than uh, 500 after the operation, they had a 10% mortality and less than one if the PVR was less than 500. <clears throat> Other predictors of mortality, these are pre-op predictors, uh, low DLCO, perhaps speaking of microvascular disease, and then a more functionally compromised status, like lower six-minute walk distance, and again, you know, higher uh, uh, pulmonary vascular resistance as well, because the higher it is, the more concern we get about significant microvascular disease. Uh, just, I'm not a surgeon, I don't operate, that we have a fabulous surgeon, but just a, key, a, key point, a few key points on this. So it's a media and astronomy, patient gets hooked up to the heart-lung machine, and they, they, are, they, are, uh, uh, they undergo deep hypothermia. The reason uh, behind this is brain protection, because the surgery requires periods of circulatory arrest. And the reason behind this is even, even when they are on the cardiopulmonary bypass machine, due to the extensive collateral flow, uh, particularly from bronchial arteries, but also mammaries and other arteries, uh, so systemic collateral flow that these patients have, even when they are hooked up to the cardiopulmonary bypass machine, the surgical field actually gets floated with uh, blood. And so you need uh, periods where you shut down the machine and there is no circulation for the surgeon to be able to have a clean field and do a, a complete endarterectomy. And actually this has been uh, tested and, and it's completely proven that you do need circulatory arrest to, uh, to perform a successful uh, operation. And also the other key point here is that it is an endarterectomy, similar to what uh, people do for carotids. So it is not an embolectomy. It's not opening up the pulmonary artery and just grabbing the clot. It's finding a plane and then stripping that plane out into the periphery of the lung. That's what makes, that's the other reason why this operation is, is complicated. <clears throat> so just a couple of examples, so a patient that we did this year, and, and the, the, the key here is to get these uh, tails, uh, so take the endarterectomy plane as far as you can see, where you see a huge amount of clot here, and this is relatively easy to remove, but what you, what you need to do is extend that endarterectomy plane as far out as you can, and uh, so this is actually a kind of a specimen that you're looking for, it's a guy with unilateral uh, chronic thromboembolic disease. So you really, uh, this part is relatively easy to, to get, but what you want is to extend the endarterectomy plane all the way out to the periphery. So we try to extubate people early. Uh, we try to resume any coagulation as soon as possible, typically within the next 24 to 48 hours, of course, barring any hemorrhagic complication. Diuresis to prevent reperfusion edema. Uh, we look for persistent pH, which is the more uh, fearsome complication. Uh, reperfusion injury, again, uh, I alluded to that and then some other, uh, you know, standard complications uh, uh, from any uh, uh, open heart operation. Um, so again, the, the, the two key complications that are unique to this are, of course, persistent pulmonary hypertension, and that's the, the rate here in, in this uh, registry. And the other one is uh, reperfusion edema. Uh, the reason this happens is that some, some of these segments that pretty much don't see any blood flow for years, now that they see blood flows, uh, they, they get, you know, pulmonary edema, and that actually can look like ARDS on your chest X-ray, and that leads to hypoxia and prolongs the, the time on the, on the ventilator. 
<clears throat> so that all mortality, UCSD, of course, uh, uh, were the pioneers, and in, in, uh, so the mortality has been getting better over time, uh, down to uh, 2%. And, uh, four and a half, 4.7, almost 5% in, in uh, uh, Europe. Uh, here at the clinic, we've been doing this for many years, but at a very, very slow pace. We have a, a program now uh, for the last four years. Uh, we've done 60 operations, so on average about 15, but that number is growing. This year, we've done already 20. Uh, that's 5% uh, mortality and 3% uh, excluding one emergent case. <clears throat> and this is a, a look at the patients that we've done, uh, again, those 60 patients. Uh, most of the male, this is the age. Uh, the, the range of age is wide. Uh, the oldest guy that we operated was 80, 81 uh, years old. Um, pretty compromised patients, uh, some of them functional class four, um, most of them functional class three, pretty lousy walk distance, pretty elevated anti pro BMP. And then again, you know, there is some variability, but clearly operation is successful. You, you normalize pulmonary pressures, you normalize uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. <coughs> So uh, I'll just skip through this. Uh, these were previous negative RCTs. Uh, and so yes, uh, Rio CWAT is the only one that has been tested, but the key is here. So the, the, the patients that enrolled into this study were either inoperable, and this was deemed by expert centers, or they had recurrent or residual pulmonary hypertension after endarterectomy. And so yes, it is effective. It improves the uh, six minute walk distance, but in those patients. So this, the patients who enrolled into the, in this study were either already operated, or they were deemed to be non-operable candidates by an expert uh, center, or by a committee, actually, of experts. So that's the key. So it is effective, but in those who cannot get operated. <clears throat> and yes, it improves also the uh, hemodynamics. And this is just a slide to show you that the, the message here is that, unfortunately, we're seeing that these patients are getting uh, treatment uh, with medical therapies more frequently than before, and, and that doesn't really improve anything. Uh, what they need really is an early referral to, uh, to a PTE uh, center. And, and the, the one of the reasons is this, of course, this is biased data because, I mean, some people get operated, some people don't. But the key here is that those who get operated do much better than those who don't get operated. So again, if, if you don't offer the operation, you're, re you're really doing a disservice uh, to these patients. And so what you need is this, you need a team uh, of people, uh, and we have you know, us and surgeons and vascular medicine, radiology, nuclear medicine, cardiology, because this, as I you know, alluded to earlier in my talk, a lot of these cases are you know, pretty complicated. Some of them are straightforward. Some of them we see, and it takes us five minutes to know that they need an operation, but some cases are, are complicated. So you need a, a team to take care of, of, of these patients. And so to finish up, <coughs> uh, these are my take home points to you. Remember that a quarter of patients uh, will not tell you that they had a PE, yet they still uh, have CTEF. Again, VQ scan is the screening uh, test of choice. Uh, please do not delay uh, the evaluation for the operation uh, in lieu of medical therapy. Uh, always refer to a PTE center. And again, you know, emphasis on the team approach with uh, dedicated specialists. Thank you very much. <coughs>